I'm very happy to be here to talk about uh, 5G millimeter wave, and I'd like to cover six points. Uh, first, I thought you might enjoy a kind of a backstory of what happened and how my students and I figured out that this 5G millimeter wave would work and some of the trials and tribulations we went through and some of the discoveries we came up with back about four or five years ago. And then I thought I'd present how those differences have kind of um, developed over time and how the 3GPP uh, global standard has evolved in the area of channel modeling. And I thought I'd do some quick comparisons because it turns out that the channel model is vital to comparing and testing. And we found some distinct differences, but because of the breakneck speed of this development for 5G new radio, probably the fastest uh, standard development in the history of wireless is 40 year history uh, to move up a, an order of magnitude of frequency. I thought that'd be interesting. And then I wanted to look at some real world issues and some things to consider uh, in the area of hybrid beam forming, uh, comp, and uh, development in general. And then I thought I'd touch on the trials, actual uh, update of what I've heard from industry leaders uh, who are actually doing the trials and what the results are. And then finally, I thought I'd look at some things that we don't often talk about in academia, but is very important to the development of new technologies like the internet, like millimeter wave wireless, and that is the regulatory framework and some of the things the FCC is doing to help speed the deployment of millimeter wave in the US. And these kinds of activities will probably be echoed around the world and other countries. And then I'll conclude. So this curve, uh, it was really interesting. Yesterday, a number of presenters talked about hype and uh, where things are and what's real and what's not. And this is a very useful uh, curve called the Gartner hype cycle. Gartner's a, uh, an information, uh, you know, kind of an analyst that's very highly regarded in the technical field. And this is the Gartner hype cycle curve. They publish it every year. And on the x-axis, it's cut off on this slide, but on the bottom, you have on the left the technological trigger. When something is triggered by a fundamental discovery or a basic uh, new uh, issue that's come up that people haven't thought about before. And so on the left, you have this uh, innovative trigger. And then here at the peak, this is maximum hype. And uh, then you go uh, in time a few more years, and then you fall into this trough of disillusionment where all the hype seems like it was overblown and it's actually not going to work well. And then as you go to the right, you kind of hit this slope of productivity where people get over the disappointment and then just start get to work. And then here you finally taper off to where it really becomes real and productive. And this is basically the utopia. It hits mainstream and everyone wins who stayed with it. And you can see here we are at the 2017. Maximum hype was deep learning and machine learning. And all of you in electrical engineering know that your enrollments are going down in the hardcore electrical engineering because everyone wants a job in deep learning, machine learning, and, and all the salaries are there for all the stuff. And, and now pundits are saying, what is everyone going to do in 2022 when that entire market busts? So we're at maximum hype now. And if you note the color, it says, well, in two to five years, it'll actually start being productive and on the slope of productivity. But right now, it's full hype. What's interesting is 2017, 5G wasn't yet quite in the maximum hype cycle. It had five to 10 years to go before it was real. So I suspect in 2018, 5G will be here in the, in the peak of maximum hype. And then maybe machine learning and deep learning will fall off. You know, and then it'll go through a trough. But what's interesting is autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, right here near the maximum hype in 2017. And it's still a lot of hype. And then you have the terrible accident with Uber, and it starts heading down into the trough of disillusionment. But it's always interesting to look at this. And uh, you know, it's good to see 5Gs here. And even business analysts, which don't always get it right, are saying five to 10 years. So they're saying 2022 to 20. 27 is when 5G will be building out. And I, I say that's probably closer to 2022 than 2027. I'd say it's probably 2020, 2021. But I, it's always fun to show. Now, how did we get here? How did we get to millimeter wave? We have NSF doing these workshops. We have the FCC making spectrum. We have 
probably tens of billions of dollars being invested around the world in various areas of 5G, even when 4G is still building out. 4G is an amazing generation of technology. It allows smartphones and applications like Uber and real-time video, and probably some people out there on the internet watching the, the real live stream or watching this on 4G. Well, here's how it happened, and I thought you might enjoy the backstory. I was at UT Austin and had done measurements at 38 gigahertz around the campus. In fact, let me go back 10 years earlier. At Virginia Tech in 1995 and 1996, I was looking at 38 gigahertz. I actually published a paper on what hail and rain do to fixed links, because this was before the LMDS, the CLEX, uh, the idea of independent local exchange carriers putting up millimeter wave. Companies like Telligent went public at unheard of valuations in the late 1990s, and a few years before that, I was showing that you could do millimeter wave communication with huge bandwidth, and that weather wasn't that much of a problem. Uh, I was doing that at 38 gigahertz. But it became very apparent to me that the semiconductor industry back in 1995 just couldn't make the devices cheap enough, and we didn't really have the internet yet on cell phones. So the idea was way too early. So I kept the equipment in mothballs, always checked it out every year or two to make sure it worked, and then in 2011, uh, as YGIG and Wireless HD and the 60 gigahertz band for Wi-Fi was ramping up, I said, now's the time to go mobile. So I did measurements at UT Austin in 2011 and actually saw amazing coverage, non-line of sight coverage, which really surprised me. And when I came to NYU, they said you could get on every roof, because I said, if I'm coming to NYU, I want to make millimeter wave tests and show the world this can work. They said, OK, we'll let you get on the roof. They don't like to do that generally. But, so I had rooftop access in New York, and I figured if we could make it in New York, we can make it anywhere. And so we put base stations up in 2012 and had a team of undergraduates, freshmen. They just finished their freshman year in college from the CS and ECE departments. And they worked tirelessly, and we made measurements all over Washington Square. Uh, on the business school uh, rotunda, on the courtyards, went all around the streets of NYU. And lo and behold, indeed, it was working. And it was working really well. We made a channel sounder that used a sliding correlator method so that you could get very good dynamic range, 140, 150, 160 dB path loss, with very wide band, 800 megahertz RF bandwidth. Yet you could get the advantage of time compression so that you could get the multipath, but you'd use this, a dilation, time dilation, use a sliding correlator, so you'd get these large link margins with relatively low power. So we're, we're using one watt of transmit power at 28 gigahertz, 800 megahertz bandwidth, and getting very comparable base station-like ranges, in fact, much less than what commercial base stations will use. And we published these papers in 2013, and I'll tell you a little story about those later, but. The bottom line is we started to collect huge amounts of data. We measured Brooklyn. We measured where you walk coming into this building and on the courtyard of Brooklyn. We had huge amounts, terabytes of data over the next few years. And one of the amazing things is we collected all this data using directional antennas. There's a channel sounder right out here uh, running at 140 gigahertz that my students are using, very similar architecture. So we would just meticulously scan with directional antennas. And what we quickly saw is that with all this directional data, there was a lot of confusion. How do you process all these little narrow slices of received energy over azimuth and elevation in different locations and make sense out of it? How do we do an impedance match or a conversion to language that the wireless industry would understand? So here's what we realized. The entire wireless industry in 2012 viewed the world as omnidirectional at the handset. In fact, the entire wireless world viewed wireless in general as kind of omnidirectional. A base station, even if it's sectored, was kind of viewed as an omnidirectional antenna. And a mobile was viewed as an omnidirectional antenna. And so when I go around and tell people in 2011 and 2012, often I was scoffed at when I said millimeter wave would work, yeah, I realized after collecting all this data that people were misinterpreting a common law which is fundamental to wireless, which is freeze free space equation, this equation right here. And what I realized is the whole world was looking at freeze free space equation, which tells you the received power over the transmitted power, 
is equal to the product of the gains of the transmitter receiver antenna times this lambda squared over four pi d squared term. What I realized is everyone was thinking that GT and GR is one. Unity gain, omnidirectional. And so what I realized is, my gosh, what we're doing is when we use a directional antenna at the transmitter, it's not one, but it's AE, the effective aperture. It's kind of like the physical area times four pi over lambda squared. And what we're doing is we're canceling out the lambda squared in the numerator here with a lambda squared in the denominator there. And so really we have the gain of the receiver antenna over D squared. So everyone says, gosh, we have this terrible higher loss at millimeter wave because as lambda goes down, down squared is up. So the loss goes up. All right? So everyone views the loss as being greater at millimeter wave. But our data said it wasn't. And I knew from this formula it wasn't. This is the biggest misconception still to date. And this is why I want to bust this myth. Millimeter wave is better, better link margin, more received power than we've ever had in wireless. And here's the math. People, at best, would figure out, OK, if I use a directional antenna, I could at least get rid of one of these lambda squareds, but I still have the 1 over d squared loss. But here's what happens when you use both the gain of the antenna and the receiver. You get a lambda squared in the numerator. You get a lambda by 4, a lambda squared squared in the denominator. So you basically get a gain. You actually get a gain from the antennas that can beat the d squared loss. In fact, if you use a constant physical area on the cell phone and a constant physical area at the base station, that is A sub E stays constant, and you change the frequencies in both these terms, you get a square increase when you go higher in frequency. And this is why all the world is surprised and shocked. The trials are better than we ever thought. Well, of course, because you get a much better link when you keep the area the same but go higher in frequencies because you're basically getting more focus. And the math shows it. But the world doesn't even still today understand it. In fact, let's look at it, the simple case where maybe you just put gain at the antenna and you keep the receiver shrinking as you go higher in frequency. If I keep the receiver on the order of lambda, that is a sub e is lambda squared, look at the gain of the receiver. Lambda squared over lambda squared is 1, and I get a 4 pi term. So basically, if I keep the transmit area constant as I go higher in frequency, and the receiver gets smaller and smaller, which is how the world always thought of it, they'd always say higher free space pass loss at higher frequency, because in their mind, they don't realize that they're shrinking the antenna as they make that proclamation. But if you keep the receiver shrinking, but the transmitter constant, the 4 pi squared cancels out, the lambda squared cancels out, and you get the same received power over all frequencies. So at worst case, if you shrink the receiver, you still get the same path loss. Now, I'm not counting weather or hail or fog or foliage or trying to get through building walls. But the bottom line is in free space, you actually get better signal to noise ratio. This is a fundamental result that the world is still trying to grasp. But the transmitter receiver area, if it stays constant, if you use the same real estate on the tower and in the handset, the received power is greater at higher frequencies than lower frequencies. <clears throat> now, how do we figure that out? How did we prove it? We had to do a lot of processing. And this paper in Globecom 2015 has kind of become the standard by how everyone processes this directional data and tries to put it in a way that we can all understand, and particularly what 3GPP understands. 3GPP had always made omnidirectional path loss models. You put the gain of the antennas on after their path loss model. It's how all the generations of cellular developed. But we figured out that it's vital to get rid of the gains in a way that's fair to what's happening. That previous slide is when you have a direct link kind of boresight aligned transmitter and receiver. When the boresight is aligned, that's a very special case. It's not a scanning receiver. It's not scanning beams. It's when you've done all that hard work, and now you have the link. But in the real world, in statistical channel modeling, when we're trying to develop systems, we don't care about knowing where the exact link is. We want to know what happens for any case. 
And that's what the omnidirectional model does. So we figured out how to process all this data regardless of the antenna gain so that you could rescale everything to an omni model and then change that back to any antenna pattern you wanted. And that's really tough. And 3GPP is still wrestling with that. And here's some of the fundamental things we found. <clears throat> While 3GPP was rushing to make a channel model so it could develop 5G new radio, uh, they were really doing it without very many measurements in the world. They had our measurements, which we provided and published aggressively so they could see it. And we helped them build channel sounders, our industrial affiliates. We worked closely with them, gave them software, hardware, tell them our vendors. So a lot of the channel sounder you see here at NYU was reproduced very rapidly by teams of engineers all over the world, the companies that build the 3GPP standard. They went out and found the same things we did. They proved it to themselves in 2014. And we launched the Brooklyn 5G Summit here as a place, a melting pot, for all these people to come together to bring the FCC, to bring federal regulators so they could see what was happening. We hold that every year in, in April. And what we found is that, remarkably, the channel model that had been used for 2G and 3G which was this floating intercept model that was standardized in the third generation and fourth generation 3GPP standards, used these parameters alpha and beta that had no physical significance. But when you get to millimeter waves, because it's very site specific, it's vital that you have a physical significance to your channel model. Otherwise, you can't make sense of what's happening with different directional antennas if you're on board side or if you're not. And so what we proved is, that if you used the old 3GPP models, you could get these really bizarre slopes for path loss, which were very specific if they happened to be measuring and a building was blocking it. But if you went over 360 degrees and you used this um, physically based model, which used a free space path loss reference at one meter, that is if you standardized everything to one meter, free space, close in, free space, you got an N value, a path loss exponent, that had significance, that had physical meaning. It went back to the original theory where N equal two is free space. In this equation, N equal two is the path loss exponent, that's free space, and N equal four would be a two-ray ground bounce model, as uh, taught in my textbook and taught by, in the 50s by Bullington. So we were able to show that there's physical significance when you use this very simple one meter universal free space path loss reference. And it was vital once you use the one meter path loss reference to understand directional path loss models because N actually goes up. You get more loss in path loss exponent if your beam is not aligned. It's when your beams are aligned, and that's what we have to do in beam forming, align the beams, align to the best bounces, find the best multipath when we're scanning. Uh, that's when N goes down. So it was really important to have both directional path loss models and universal free space path loss reference. <clears throat> now this met with resistance from a lot of the industry. 3GPP didn't want to use a, in a one meter free space because they had software written below six gigahertz. So they kept on doing the ABG model. But they did concede that this was better for millimeter wave and so it actually made it into the standard. Shu Sun and George McCartney, two PhD students, were able to get the CI model into the 3GPP standard. I'd never had grad students during their PhD actually get a 3GPP contribution. So that was pretty good and an acknowledgement that the world was seeing that this is different. Now, there are other things that 3GPP did in the development of their channel model in haste. They basically took all the stuff below six gigahertz that were done with pretty much omni or omni-like antennas, certainly not with the beam width you need at millimeter wave you know, 10 or 20 degrees. They'd used broader beam antennas. And they basically took all the parameters for number of scatterers, number of clusters, time cluster, and brought that into the 3GPP standard. It was fast, it was quick. They'd all have a standard channel model to compare their algorithms with. Problem is, it was wrong. We had all these terabytes of data and we're processing it. And while 3GPP assumed there's 12 clusters and 20 rays per clusters, we were finding there's much fewer clusters. In fact, there's only at six at most, usually six directions, not 19. And usually, these are random, depending on where you are in the streets of New York or Brooklyn, and not fixed. And this is problem, as we'll see in a minute, because if you have fixed number of clusters or paths or diversity paths, that basically means you have to build that many RF receivers to get all the energy, or have that many chains, or Conversely, it means that your channel has much more diversity than it really does. 
Turns out that 3GPP and the people at it are pretty wise because they knew that wouldn't do a whole lot on capacity, and I'll show you that it doesn't. You, you get a, on the order of two a uh, factor of 3 dB in capacity using the different models. But where it does come into play is how to build a receiver, and I'll talk that in a minute. So here you had industry using this ABG alpha, beta, gamma model, which had three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, which are just path loss parameters that have no physical significance. And we used the close-in reference distance model, which had only one parameter. One parameter, this value of n right there the path loss exponent. So three parameters versus one parameter with virtually the same standard deviation. In other words, the ABG path loss model was over, oversubscribed in terms of number of parameters. And that's why you got these really weird looking curves in the ABG model if you happen to specifically measure one particular angle at one particular building or had one group of buildings blocking your measurements. Very much measurement dependent in ABG. The CI model, close-in model, was much more accurate. And it used this free space anchor at one meter and one gigahertz. Now, why one meter? <clears throat> one meter is pretty much in the far field of most millimeter wave mobile devices. But here's the other reason why one meter. And I never really expressed this till today. One meter wavelength is 300 megahertz, right? All the millimeter waves way above 300 megahertz. In fact, UHF cellular started above 300 megahertz. So lambda at one meter is 300 megahertz is a frequency much lower than we use in millimeter wave. If you just put a lambda less, uh, a lambda of one here, everything cancels out and you see the point I made earlier immediately. If lambda is one, you can immediately see that with lambda of one, the gains, the a sub e squareds come into the numerator. And so using a lambda of one meter, you very, very quickly can see the fact that your gain increases by the square of the frequency when it goes up. Another reason why is if lambda is less than one meter, you also see that very quickly. If you put a lambda less than one, you get a less than one squared over a less than one to the fourth. What's a less than one squared over less than one to the fourth? Much, much greater than one squared. So again, you see that the gain's very quick. So this one meter has very nice intuition as well as being accurate. And so we uh, also noticed in these field measurements over 28, 38, 73 gigahertz, now 140 gigahertz we're measuring, that while the industry and a lot of common models want to force the joint spatial and temporal cluster definition, we found that field measurements don't do that. See, here's what the channel model is in cost in 3GPP. They force an assumption that any multipath that happens in the channel model are both spatially and temporally joint distributed. That is, any multipath delay that arrives at a certain nanosecond delay must come from a particular angle. They force that joint distribution. That the angle of arrival, it happens to be also coming from a uh, time delay but we found in the streets of Manhattan that I could have a multipath at 10 nanoseconds coming from a nearby building, and at the same 10 nanoseconds, I have, could have something coming right behind me from the other building. So in that case, you have two rivals at one time delay coming from two different angles. So the joint spatial temporal model used by 3GPP and in a lot of textbooks is not what you see in field data. Actually, in field data, you see time delays coming at many, many different delays from the same angle. Maybe it's a building here, 300 meters away, and another building 500 meters away that's taller. The energy will still come from the same angle many hundreds of nanoseconds apart. We saw this. And so we defined this definition of uh, clusters where you have time clusters but spatial lobes, where there are no more than six spatial lobes, and there's uh, many time clusters. We have the distributions. We saw it time and again. We processed all this data. And um, we call this the uh, a time cluster spatial lobe approach. Now, the energy in space always has to be equal to the energy in time. The area under this curve is the area under that curve. Space and time energy is the same. But it's different. It's a different approach, and it's a statistical approach. So we made this simulator, NYU SIM, came out in 2016. FCC was interested in it to validate some of the things they were seeing. Uh, in fact, the FCC followed our work very closely. They would call me. Michael Ha would come up to our Brooklyn 5G Summit back in the early days, before the world believed. They really wanted to see if this was happening. And indeed, they saw it was real. 
they use the simulator, and it basically recreates all the measurements we've made. So you can get free, open source, downloadable in MATLAB, uh, this simulator, NYU Sim, which replicates all of this. And here's some of the interesting outputs of NYU Sim uh, versus the 3GPP channel model. Let's look at the eigenvalues of HH uh, Hermitian, which is basically telling you the energy or the diversity paths, the rank you have of the channel. This is the famous Raleigh channel, which is why OFDM evolved and became vital in all 3G wireless. The beauty of having narrow band channels, narrow band tones, is why OFDM is so great. And we talk about it in chapter two of the millimeter wave textbook that Robert Heath and I wrote with our PhD students. This is why OFDM happened. This is why we love it. OFDM is a bunch of narrow band channels. Narrow band channels are flat fading. Flat fading in any mobile environment is Rayleigh. Really, and this is why we use it, because you can use MIMO in OFDM. Because you have all these narrow band tones that are all fading Rayleigh. Really. That's the Rayleigh channel. In wideband channels, though, uh, NYU, SIM, and 3GPP, here's what you have when you basically demodulate and are looking over wider bandwidths. NYU, SIM has fewer higher ranked eigenvalues or channels. So we have like three main channels. 3GPP predicts four or five channels. So you can see that the rank in 3GPP as assumes there's more diversity. The largest four eigenvalues you can see here. NYU SIM has fewer but larger eigenvalues. 3GPP has weaker but more eigenvalues. And this is going to lead directly to hybrid beam forming results, digital beam forming results, diversity results, signal processing. Now, we just published this paper last week. The new proof just came in. And this is kind of the definitive discussion of all of this all of the channel models, and in this paper we look at hybrid beamforming, we look at single user MIMO, we look at multi-user MIMO, and we look at comp for a three cell base station from three to 12 users. If you're working on beamforming or comp, this is a remarkable resource, just, just went online like three days ago, and it's basically a culmination of everything I've just talked about. The NYU SIM versus 3GPP, and the result of receiver architectures and hybrid beamforming and comp. And I wanna go into some of the results now of the two PhD students, George McCartney and Shu Sun, who helped bring a lot of these ideas uh, to, to the world. So we've heard a lot about beamforming. <clears throat> we've heard, and, and I need to finish up pretty quickly here. Uh, we've heard a lot about beamforming. We've heard a lot about digital beamforming. And one of the interesting things is uh, analog beamforming, which is right now being used in most of the trials, is very simple. You have a single RF chain. You basically have RF pre-coding a network that's going to do RF distribution to the antennas to basically get fixed beams. Digital beam forming is kind of the holy grail. This gives you maximum flexibility. Uh, you can put a beam wherever you want with amazing fidelity uh, based on the resolution of your array. The problem is that you need a lot of DACs. You need an RF chain for each of the antenna elements, which right now, today, is expensive, and will be expensive probably for three to five years. So why hybrid beam forming? Hybrid beam forming basically takes advantage of baseband pre-coding and RF pre-coding, uh, RF distribution, phase shifters, to kind of find the best of both worlds. You use a large number of antennas so you can get good array fidel fidelity, but you can use fewer RF chains, less cost, less power, and it's very, very close to the spectral efficiency in a real system simulation that you get with digital beamforming. That is, you're like within 5% of the spectral efficiency if you go to prop the effort of all those digital beamformers. And so you'd start using beamforming with various approaches of comp, where you, today's cellular, we use a lot of these single cell, uh, and multi-user MIMO is where a single base station will send to multiple uh, users. But comp is something that we've looked at in 4G a lot of complexity, and so we wanted to kind of bookend what happens for a single user MIMO case, a multi-user MIMO case in a single cell, and what happens if we ever get to comp with best beam forming. So I'll just quickly give the highlights of the work. We all know what 4G and 5G is. Um, and so basically, we're gonna look at non-comp and comp using different beam forming architectures, and they're discussed in that paper I just mentioned that came out two days ago. I think these are the world's first results of comp. First, we've got measurements we made on this campus. This is the map of our campus. 
and George McCartney for an entire summer of 2016 took very high resolution angle measurements, thousands of angular measurements from all these base station locations and received them at the other locations. And we built this database and the bottom line is even with a high density base station cluster, there aren't that many places in a mobile system where you're gonna have a lot of interference. That is, maybe you could get 16% of the time in full interference twice the capacity using comp. But most of the time, 43% and 35%, that's like 80% of the time, you rarely get capacity gains using comp. In fact, Xu Sun looked at the simulations which are in that paper and found the same thing. And by the way, these bits per second per hertz are kind of hypothetical. You know, it's hard to get 10 bits per second per hertz with modulation, but it's kind of a reference, it's a benchmark. If you look at this going three user and 12 user per cell, uh, the NYU SIM channel model predicts more capacity by about 25 to 80% more capacity. But the bottom line is comp's not gonna give you a whole lot. This is baseline with a single cell just forming single beams. This is the best you can get with signal leakage noise. Akbar, one of your students helped kind of develop this idea. And you can see that at the 90% point, you maybe get a little bit more using comp, but not a whole lot more bits per second per hertz. In fact, um, knowing this, the industry is now building out these trials and they're not looking at comp and probably won't be for, for probably won't use comp because millimeter wave is not interference limited. It's basically link limited. You don't have a lot of interference, which is what George's work showed. So here's what's happening in trials real quick. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of trials in Texas, largest 5G trial at the silos. Uh, attenuation by tinted glass is major. They have launched 5G already. There's one gigabits per second download speeds, less than 10 milliseconds latency, reported at 15 and 20 g uh, gigahertz. This is before the 5G NR. And uh, they're gonna be using standalone pucks, pucks that take the outdoor signal from fixed wireless and distribute it indoor. Verizon's going in 11 cities. They're going better than they ever thought they would. Well over a gigabit per second, 10 milliseconds, and again, prior to 5G NR, which just came out last month. So trials are working. They're really excited. Intel's got a product, which uh, they call the uh, uh, mobile uh, access unit, which they put right at the window and the wall. They take the fixed wireless access signal from the base station of 5G and then redistribute it using a hockey puck. Here's what it looks like. This is the wireless remote radio head. The station comes in from 5G, the fixed wireless access. It's then redistributed. They're getting three gigabits per second. And then the FCC, trying to ramp this, created this uh, rule uh, just recently, a few months ago. Um, they asked our opinion. We gave it to them. We said, look, you've got to make it easy for the wireless companies to deploy. You've got to make it easy for them to get on lampposts. Right now, cities and municipalities realize they can charge money and hold up the permitting process for carriers that want to deploy small cells. They see this as a revenue grab, and the wireless carriers view this as a tax, a tax on mobile broadband. You know, if you're gonna call it a tax, call it a tax, don't hold up our business. So the FCC is trying to remove unnecessary barriers um, and trying to make it possible for small cells to be uh, legally deployed without onerous rights. And uh, we asked our industrial affiliates before we talked to the commission, what do you need? What do you want to see wireless happen quickly at millimeter wave? And here's what they said, it's gotta be fast. They, they said the small cell order is a great first step, but we really need more mid-band spectrum and they want these auctions happening. FCC listened, auctions are happening this November, which I predicted back at the Brooklyn 5G Summit. Even though the FCC was hedging, they said it'll be next year. I said it'll happen this year, it's happening this year. Um, you need to give them right of ways. These companies are desperate to get right of way on poles and lamps. They want to avoid zoning. They have to be reasonable. They can't put up ugly things, but this is a big deal. And, um, and then you, uh, Michael Marcus, who's here, has helped propel this 95 gigahertz and above spectrum horizons. So in conclusion, uh, 4G LTE, which we have today, is morphing into 5G. You won't see comp used. You will see massive, uh, multiple, uh, multi-user MIMO and comp. Uh, comp only gives you about five bits per second per hertz greater than uncoordinated. Is it worth it? Read the paper. And carriers have to decide because right now I don't think it's worth it. 
certainly in this early stage. Maybe in six, seven years, it'll be worth it. Uh, interference is so much less of a concern with these directional arrays. That's why comp's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. The myth busting I showed you shows that there's greater signal to noise ratio, greater data rates, and greater coverage as you go higher in frequency. Sands the weather, but you know, over a few hundred meters, rain's not an issue. I gave you some recent testimonies and stressed some key regulatory needs and the auctions that are now happening. happening. And in conclusion, millimeter wave really is the tip of the iceberg. The FCC's gotten out in front on these issues, but countries all over the world, primarily in Asia, are working very, very rapidly on this. Finally, I want to thank the NYU Wireless Industrial Affiliates Program. Qualcomm is here, uh, Osgay. Uh, all these companies are great partners. Uh, we really work closely with them and take their inputs to the FCC. It's very harmonious and symbiotic. They hire our students. I want to thank them. And I want to thank my three current PhD students, Yun Chao Zing, Ojas Kanheri, and um, Shi Hao Ju, who are exhibiting some of the stuff as they kind of follow in the footsteps of George and Shu in trying to tease out the knowledge. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ted, for a very exciting and energetic. This is one of those talks where you almost need a debriefing. Uh, you know, because uh, with all due respect, not everything was correct. So, you know, students take your words correct, you know, seriously. One question I have for you uh, is comp. You said, hey, it's not. And one of your, we were talking to one of your colleagues, uh, Shiva, I don't think he's here, that, you know, blockage, if you think in terms of latency, right, the other elephant in the room, that's where comp may be useful. Interference is not the issue, but suppose it gets blocked, you may want to use another one. I didn't mention in the talk, we considered that. We have a blockage model. We have a human blockage model. We published it a year and a half ago. It's a yeah. four-state uh, Markov model, and that was included in the analysis by George McCartney. George actually, and his PhD yeah. thesis was, is open access. He's working on a journal paper. So we considered that. We considered human blockage in the NYU campus layout. And still, even with human blockage, there was not that much outage. And remember, he has all these beams. And the human outage is very slow. You can predict when the person's starting to walk. And so if you have all these beams, you can basically look and quickly make another beam and rescue. We have all that data and showed that you could quickly get away from the blockage and point somewhere else. Yeah, well, that's uh, OK. So you know, it's, like, it's not just the physical layer. Right? It's the networking layer that has to talk to yeah. it as well. Uh, Okay, well, any other questions? Dan has a question Dan. back there. I just wanted to follow up on that. Would you expect that statement to still be true above 95 gigahertz? That's a great question. Will that still be true at 95 gigahertz? I believe it will be. I think you have some answers in some of your work. But yes, I believe still above 95 gigahertz, you will indeed be able to do the same thing. Look, order of magnitude of 30 gigahertz is 300 gigahertz. Channels don't change that much over an order of magnitude of frequency. In fact, if we used seven degree beam widths 10 years ago and measured the channels for 3GPP, we would find very similar things than we're finding today. It's just now we know the technology will allow small form factors with very directional antennas. The industry wasn't thinking about that 10 years ago in a cell phone. So yes, I believe it'll be, well, I believe it'll follow. I, I, I would, so, so directionally channels become sparse. I think that's one of the reasons why hybrid works and why interference Absolutely. is not there. And I think so channels do change in that regard that you're not gonna be having this diffuse rich scattering. That was your really co. Well, that's, it's a very good observation. He's right that in general it becomes more sparse because diffraction goes away as you get to these higher frequencies. The diffraction is based on the physical world. However, I did measurements uh, as a paper like back in 96 with a giant horn this big at 2 gigahertz and I found similar sparsity. I published it. Of no course. one cares. That's narrow beams. Yeah, exactly. Yes, narrow my, beams point, is the thing. my point is when you go narrow beam yes. at any frequency, the channel by definition is My point is, is that if you go to very high frequencies, any damn antenna is narrow beam. Yeah, well, yeah, because you, you have to physically well, you, make you, it. You yeah. can't make it broad. That's right. So. Uh, okay, well, any other questions before we arm wrestle? <laughs> well, Ted, thank you so much for a very inspiring and informative talk. I have a, a bit of a technical question. This is related to the clustering model that you have and specifically to the uh, channel coherence time in a, in a beam forming environment. Uh, and just to give you a background, I'm trying to figure out how often one has to do tracking and kind of uh, 
uh, changing of the beam. Uh, you know, so how long does the channel maintain its coherence time uh, under mobility, and how would the clustering phenomenon uh, impact? Great question. That? Great question. And Shi Ju, one of my students, is actually working on this idea of spatial consistency. We have all this data, and we're going to put that model in NYU sim. We don't have it in yet. The bottom line with coherence time is it's roughly related to the inverse of the Doppler frequency. So basically, what's the Doppler? And when you look at the Doppler at millimeter waves, it goes up by a factor of 10 from where we are in today's cellular. So in a high-speed car today at cellular, you've got Doppler of what, about 200 hertz? So you can imagine up at millimeter waves at a high-speed car, you've gonna, you're going to have Doppler of 2,000 hertz, 2 kilohertz, which is going to be about a half of a, micro, a millisecond. So you basically have 500 microseconds while the channel is static. That's why packet durations of 50 to a couple hundred microseconds will basically be like a static channel. And by the way, that's a very short time, but you can get lots of bits through at very high data rates. So you're kind of looking on the order of uh, fractions of a millisecond while you've got a static channel. And that's a lot of time. The overhead, I mean, we're going to take five milliseconds to kind of figure out where all the beams are. You can't go very far in five milliseconds on a track. So generally, the channels will be spatially consistent. 3GPB said spatial consistency is within a 15-meter uh, grid. You know what? We made measurements that showed in a 5 by 10-meter grid, the average path loss really doesn't change. So that means the clustering's not changing. So if you figure in a 10 meter distance, whatever speed you're going, the channel's not going to change very much. In fact, we have a VTC paper in the uh, uh, workshop that Kate uh, is heading up that uh, talks about spatial consistency. So the bottom line is you've got 10 or 15 meters in general, unless you're going around a corner. You know, if you, go, you happen to go right around a corner in millimeter wave, you know, you're obviously going to change clustering because you're going to change serving base stations. But um, generally, you can think that as kind of a stationary region uh, from what we've seen in the measurements. Does that answer your question? I'll add to that. that you know, I think a lot of people, this is another myth that things are moving too fast in millimeter wave. But we have to remember, yeah. our sampling intervals are in nanoseconds. Right. That's large bandwidth, so it's in super slow motion. So you can track the hell out of things. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that is uh, true, a uh, shorter way of saying it, maybe. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> so besides the, uh, besides the channel uh, during a packet, right, you say the channel during the packet is constant, and so you can just use it as a static thing. But then when you go to the networking level, it's not just one packet. You may need to retransmit. You may need to schedule and decide when it's good to schedule transmissions. And if you know that your channel is going to be static for 1,000 packets or 1,000 slots, then your ARQ strategy, for example, would be different compared to when you know that every transmission is essentially IAD. And so that knowledge, I mean, one, one can roughly say, oh, at these speeds and at these frequencies, don't worry, everything's going to be static for your single transmission. But what about you know, the more complex scenario where you have multiple transmission, you need to schedule, decide when to transmit. And so in that scenario, it becomes important to be able to say what is the correlation in time and in space for a multi-user system. And so we, I think we need measurements for that. Yeah. We need measurement for uh, correlations because now it becomes important. Now you've done the uh, marginal statistics, right? The PDF of the signal transmission. Now give us the correlations because we networking people need that. Yeah, you hear that, Shihao? You hear that? That's your, that's, your, that's your master's thesis. We're doing that right now, actually. He is going through all our database of measurements, looking at the track measurements we have because we've made so many track measurements, and he's writing the correlation. Now we've published correlations on received fading envelope. In December of 2017, in the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society special issue on 5G, you will see the correlation distance as a function of antenna of the received power, of the received power envelope. So you have correlation right now on what's going to happen to the received signal. It's published and it's available. We have the mathematical models. The other thing is, is the clusters, we, there's not a lot known, 
but we're going to get that data. And we've got spatial consistency figured out to our first order, and we're going to put that in NYU SIM so that you can get that correlation so over a track. So debriefing is absolutely in order. So with all due respect, these horn antenna data is not indicative of the phase ray narrow beam data that may be used. So we need some more different measurements in addition to processing the old measurements. I know you guys are getting better sounders, and they're going to be built, but... Uh, you always need more degrees, measurements. And 20 degrees is too wide. That's not what the systems. We have to measure them at the resolution that they're going to be seeing yeah. at the spatial resolution, which is still not being done. More measurements are always welcome. We're using 7 to 30 degree beam with 7, 20 to 30. But you're right. Look, you need more measurements. So this is so new. The world doesn't yet understand this. And until you measure and see it yourself, you really can't understand it. Absolutely. Let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. For